My name is Lisa Chase and I'm a professor at University of Vermont Extension and the director of the Vermont Tourism Research Center. Today we are talking about virtual farm and food experiences. And this agritourism gathering today is the fourth in a series of monthly gatherings that are going to take us through the spring and most of the way to when the International Workshop on Agritourism will take place in Vermont, in person, in August of 2021. We hope, we hope. We're looking at other options, but let's keep it at that for now. I wanna mention that a major sponsor for the conference and also for these virtual gatherings is Yonder, a new booking site that promotes farm stays and other nature rich guest experiences. Founded and advised by farmers, Yonder highlights stewards or hosts that have a connection to their local community, practice environmental responsibility, and exhibit hospitality that's reflective of this commitment. Through the Yonder site and app, guests can discover and book overnight stays and activities at farms in the US now and coming soon in Europe as well. Yonder is expanding around the world and they're an important partner for the International Agritourism Network that was first launched at the World Congress on Agritourism, which was held in Bolzano, Italy in 2018 and was organized by URAC Research. Through this virtual gathering today, we're continuing to build this network until we can meet again in person at the conference in Vermont. In just a moment, we're going to dive into today's topic, which is creating virtual farm and food experiences. But first, I wanna get a sense of who is here with us. So I am launching a poll now. You should see on your screen a poll that asks you who you are essentially, and please check all that apply. While you're filling it out, I wanna mention that we had, as of this morning, we, we had um, 488 people registered from over three, 30 different countries. And it looks like we've got about 200 people here with us today. And for some of you, it's the middle of the night and you probably should be sleeping. One of the, um, as, as grateful that I am that we can have these virtual gatherings and still connect during the pandemic, it's not nearly the same as being in a room all together and being out and being able to look out at, at everyone's faces. So the, the closest we have to approximate that is the chat box. So once, once you've busy answered, once, you've, you know, once you're done answering who you are in this poll, if you wouldn't mind, type into the chat who you are and where you're from. I was able to see the registration list so I could see you know, what an incredibly amazing and diverse group we have here, but I wanna be able to share a little bit while respecting people's um, anonym anonymity, I wanna be able to share a little bit of that with you. So if you're willing to share who you are, um, where you live and what you do, please type that into the chat. You should see on your screen now who is here with us today. And it looks like we're about 37% farmers and ranchers. And then we've got a bunch of extension, nonprofits, educators, government agencies, researchers, and others. I'm gonna stop sharing these results. And then we have what, today we have one more poll that is specific for the topic that we're dealing with today. And that is, how often do you offer virtual experiences? Some of you I'm sure will say never. Um, and you know, at the top we've got regularly and we're doing this to get a sense of how experienced you folks are. So, and while you're filling that in, I'll, I just wanna thank everyone who, when you registered, we got a lot of really excellent questions that you're hoping the panelists will address today. And we've, I'm pretty sure we're not gonna get through all of them, but I think our, present, our presenters have seen the questions and they'll be addressing a lot of them um, as they speak. And we're gonna make sure we have some time for Q&A throughout. So at any point, um, there's a little Q&A box 
put your questions into the Q&A box, and also feel free to type into the chat if you've had a similar experience or just want to weigh in. I know these webinars, we, we all spend way too much time on Zoom and you know it can get a little, um, it's hard to stay engaged when somebody else is talking. So um, feel free to type into chat and you know keep yourself connected and engaged um, in different ways. I'm going to share the results here. Wow, and it looks like a lot of people, almost 20% are regularly offering virtual experiences. Um, and we've only got about a quarter um, that have never done it. And actually we've got some not yet, about 27% not yet, but planning to in the future. I'll stop this share now. And what I wanna stop sharing my screen entirely. And what I wanna do now is introduce our speaker. I think I've got it on gallery view. So once again, thanks to all of you for joining us today. We are very lucky to have two uh, excellent presenters and amazing entrepreneurs. Our first speaker is Eleanor Leger. She founded Eden Ice Cider Company with her husband, Albert, in January of 2008. And she has been leading the business since then, including product development, brand, sales and distribution, finance and administration, and pretty much everything else. She has been, she holds an advanced workshop certificate in cider production from Cornell University and has been elected twice to the board of directors of the US Association of Cider Ma Makers. Before moving to the farm or moving to the orchard, um, Eleanor brings her role at Eden over 20 years of experience as a management consultant and senior executive in the financial services and software industries. So not necessarily your typical uh, farming background, but for, you know, there, there's a lot of people coming from different places and getting into farming and food experiences today. So Eleanor, thank you so much for joining us and I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I, uh, we started in 2008, if you remember, that was the financial crisis, um, which is starting to feel similar again. And um, that was a, a turning point for me in my life and what I wanted to do with it. And um, that's how I ended up going from software to um, growing apples and making cider. Um, I'm gonna share my screen very quickly to talk about what we've been doing with virtual experiences. Um, and while I do that, I should say and just give everybody the context that we are a very small cider maker. Um, we do about 10,000 gallons of cider a year. Um, so it's uh, uh, for uh, the, the situation I'm talking about is something that can apply to a lot of small producers. It's not big, big um, industrial folks at all. Um, so our mission, just briefly, as a cider maker is to produce one delicious ciders. Um, all 100% of the apples that we use for our ciders are grown either in our orchard or in other small family orchards nearby. Um, our orchard is a holistically managed orchard, so we are working to spread regenerative growing practices among the orchards that we work with. Um, we work on minimizing our carbon footprint and supporting our team and our community. Um, it's just a little bit about who we are. Um, I know we've got people from 30 different countries, so for those of you who are able to see this on your screen, I just wanted to give you a sense of where we are. If you look at a map of the United States, we are in the northeast corner, uh, but not on the ocean. We're kind of sandwiched between New York State and Maine, and Quebec is to our north. Um, and within the state, we're located very close to the Canadian border, so we have a pretty cold climate. Um, the snow behind me is a good representation of what it looks like right now. Um, and so, and we're in a very rural area that's, um, you know, been pretty depressed for a long time. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we're working to, to keep things going and, and um, add to the um, agricultural economy um, of the area. Um, this is just a quick shot of us, who we are in our location. And see another shot of the big red barn and it's a very beautiful area lots of mountains and lakes um, 
Uh, these are two different lakes that are near our facility. This is a picture of our orchard. It's a beautiful place. We love to welcome people there. We don't do that anymore. Um, and here are some of our partner orchards. These beautiful old orchards with you know 80 to 100 year old trees. They're just gorgeous. Um, the fruit that they produce is amazing. Um, and from that fruit, we make a wide variety of ciders, but they're all from a wine point of view where it's about expressing the quality of this amazing fruit without adulteration, no added sugar, no water. It's just, it's just the apple juice that makes the cider. Um, but it's not just about the cider. Uh, we have a tap room. Adam welcomes you in. Um, you sit down, you get to taste lots of different ciders. People have a good time together. They bring their friends, they make an outing. It's an event, um, share their favorite cider. And then we do major events and just, you know, here's a great cider dinner we did and boy, we can't do that anymore, which is really sad. Remember when we used to do that? It was really fun. <laughs> so, um, so how can we replace that? We really can't, but we can do things that maybe get close. Um, so in June, after we'd sort of figured out we weren't gonna totally go under right away, um, we were scrambling to think of things that we could do to give people some kind of an experience of our product that wasn't just um, try and find our website and buy something. Um, and we created a little tasting kit that went from dry to medium cider to a sweet cider, and we got a Zoom account for $15 a month um, and set up scheduled um, live guided tastings with me um, once or twice a week um, where people could buy the kit from our website, click on the link and register for the Zoom and then participate in the tasting. And um, we did, didn't run it, we started from a webinar point of view and quickly went back to a meeting because the groups were small enough and people really wanted to interact and ask questions. So that was a key, key part of the experience. Um, the, the morning of the session, if you registered for a session, we sent an email that said, get ready, just to remind them, um, but also to point out things like you're gonna need a corkscrew. <laughs> um, you might wanna have some kind of a, something to dump stuff in if you don't wanna you know, finish tasting it for any reason. I don't know why, but you might. Um, and we gave them our social media handles in case they wanted to just publish anything about that and share it around. Um, and afterwards, especially early on, we sent everybody um, a survey to get their feedback. Was this working? Were they liking it? Were they going to tell their friends to do it or tell their friends not to do it? That was, we don't have advertising dollars, so word of mouth is like really important. So we sent them a pretty standard um, net promoter survey. The first question is, how likely are you to recommend this tasting to friends, colleagues, or family members? on a scale of zero to 10, where zero is not at all likely and 10 is extremely likely. Um, and the data um, came back great. So 90% um, of the respondents gave us a nine or a 10 um, and nobody gave us a score less than a seven. Um, and when we asked them, so what are the reasons for your rating of how likely you are to recommend, people said things like, I already have. A couple of my friends have already bought a couple of kits and I'm working on more or it was really fun. It was just all around a great escape for us that didn't involve leaving the house. So you can see people were really appreciating the opportunity to do something like this. Um, and um, that uh, led us to say, okay, this is gonna be something we should continue to do. And we created a page on our website um, and put virtual tastings and events in the main navigation as one of our you know, the first um, levels down from our homepage. And that turned out to be really important in, way, in a way that I hadn't anticipated, which is for search engine optimization, the fact that you have virtual tastings in a prime navigation link um, meant that when people were looking, starting to look for virtual experiences after they'd been shut down for a couple months and they were pretty bored, um, we showed up, um, which was great. Um, Another thing we did that um, has been very productive, although I haven't had the time to go actually do the number crunching on it, was in the box when we sent the kit was either an offer for free shipping if you order in a certain period of time or order, order a certain amount, 
an offer to, hey, we've got a cider club, join our cider club. Um, and so giving people a reason to keep buying from us after the tasting. Um, and then of course people do one tasting and they're like, well, I don't want to do taste the same stuff again. So we pretty quickly introduced um, additional tasting kits. Um, so now we have four for you to go through. So um, if you like the first one, you've got three more you can do over the next few months. Um, and um, really early on, um, we got the kind of request of, gee, you know, at my son's birthday is coming up. Could we do a private session with you for all of our family? Um, and so we very quickly realized there was an opportunity to do things for groups um, on a private basis. And we had a page on our website that was about wedding and corporate and group gifts. And we added to that schedule a private virtual tasting party with Eleanor. And we set up a separate um, email called parties at Eden Ice Cider. <laughs> to or even ciders um, for people to contact us about that contact us about that so we would be able to keep track of it and respond appropriately and we came up with a flyer particularly for the corporate groups who you know, might have slightly larger budgets than individuals um, giving them an opportunity to yeah you can buy our $50 tasting kit but oh you can add cheese for 99 or you can get some of our really special ciders and craft your own and I think the, the most we've charged for a kit um, so far has been um, 130 bucks, um, you know, and when you've got 30 to 50 people, that's a nice chunk of change for like one event where you, the, um, the shipping happens all at once. It's the same box to everybody. You just bang it out, ship it out the door. Um, and it's a still a one hour tasting. Um, it's not any longer um, just because they bought a bigger box. Um, so that's been particularly lucrative. Um, so just some data. Um, you know, as I said, we're small. Our, our, we have eight people in our company. We're not really big. These are these are numbers. You know, this is meant not um, this is not half our business by any stretch, but it's sort of that extra ten percent that's really helped um, be a cushion for us as we you know continue to sort of pivot and adjust to the new world. We've done thirty public scheduled tastings between June and November. Um, Twenty private groups. We've grown our customer list by almost five hundred people. Um, which right now in the middle of the holiday season is, um, you know, delivering dividends. Um, and as I said, I haven't had, a, haven't had a chance to stop to breathe, let alone trace through all the sort of new cider club or club members that came from a tasting. But um, we, we know that it's having an impact as we, you know, so, oh, I remember that name as it goes by. Um, so, um, yeah, so we will continue this and continue to, you know, get feedback and learn how we can, um, make it attractive to people. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. I'm putting a picture up here of the spring because we're all looking forward to that right now. So I Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you so much. We have um, a few questions. You know, we've got the big list of questions from before, and we have a few more questions that have come in. So, you know, some of the questions have been about the logistics. Did you pre-ship out the ciders ahead of time to the households so they could participate? How are you managing the, the logistics? Yes, so the, the page on our website, um, and if you're online, you can go and look at it, it, says buy your tasting kit and sign up and register for a tasting. So, um, and because there's a list of tastings, they know when they get their package, they can register for one that's gonna work for them. Yeah, so every, it's presumed that people have received their package by the time they sign up for a tasting. Another question is, have you found an optimal length of time for the virtual tastings? And if so, what is it? It's an hour. It somehow always is an hour. And we, we have a, pre, we started two key things. One is don't make them wait for you to talk forever before they get to open something and taste it, right? So the first thing we do is say, it's five o'clock, open that bottle, <laughs> pour it in your glass, and I'm gonna show you a few pictures. And we have a presentation that's, you know, at the beginning of the presentation I gave you was sort of the pictures of where we are and what we do and all that kind of stuff. It takes about 15 minutes. Um, and then we walk through each of the ciders um, and sort of answer sort of some key questions about each of them. And then it's a free flow Q&A. And there's always a couple of geeky people who ask wonderful questions. 
um, and there's lots to talk about, but it sort of naturally always wraps up in an hour. Another question is, are there any shipping limitations, regional only, just in the U.S.? Ah, uh, um, alcohol is complicated. So within the U.S., every state has different rules and regulations, and that's a whole other topic. But um, And if somebody is trying to ship alcohol in the U.S., get in touch with me because I have 10 years of experience and it's really complicated. Um, but we have software and all kinds of compliance systems that help us do that. Um, shipping outside the U.S. is possible, but it's inordinately expensive. It's like $100 to ship three bottles of cider to Europe. Um, it's $80 to ship three bottles of cider to Ontario. Um, and, you know, there's duty and all these kinds of things. So it, it just doesn't make any sense, unfortunately. Yes. Speaking um, that of being stuff. said, I'll do, I will say one thing, which is we have exported to the UK. So in those countries where we sent a whole bunch of cider that's there to be purchased, um, you know, through distribution, um, we have been able to do some virtual tastings with our distribution partners in the UK um, and in South Korea. So that's been cool. Yes. Let's see, the questions keep coming in and we'll do a few more. And um, we've got time for a few more before we uh, switch presenters. Um, what e-commerce plugin are you using on the website? Ah, it's a winery system, right? As so I mentioned the complex complexity of, of rules and regulations, we have to withhold tax and it's different in every state. And so um, it's really a winery e-commerce system that can handle the requirements of that. I, if I were not in the alcohol business, um, Shopify seems to be the solution that everybody uses and um, everybody seems to have a good experience with it. Yeah, there's the, that, that's a whole nother topic, <laughs> right? <laughs> which may be something, I mean, there's a lot of resources online. Um, and, you know, feel free to reach out to me there. There's, yeah, there's a lot of resources and information online and, you know, webinars as well um, in terms of what e-commerce platforms seem to work best for different products and different groups. Um, Alice is wondering for non-private events, do you have the participants in, introduce themselves or do you only do that for the private events? How, you know, kind of how personal are these? So the private events, people tend to know each other, right? It's a group of, it's a team in a corporation or it's a family. Um, so it's the public ones where we do ask people to introduce themselves. Um, and it's really, it's been just delightful to get online and interact with people from North Carolina to California to Wisconsin in ways that actually don't happen physically in the, you know, in the old world. Um, uh, so that's, that's been really fun. How many people do you max the group out at? Um, we never, it's so it's really limited by Zoom. Um, you, uh, on the meetings, there's a there's a hundred device maximum. Um, and I don't think we've had a public tasting that's had more than 32, um, which has been fine. Um, and our largest corporate uh, one has been about 75. Wow, so yeah, 75 people at once. But I suppose it's a corporate one. You know, they're already like part of this culture. They're expecting that. Yeah. Um, and so we have a question. Um, do I understand correctly that you did not open to the public this summer, even just for buying products? Um, our, uh, we were open for purchasing. And in fact, we were open once Vermont opened for um, open restaurants back up. We did open, we were limited to six people at a time and they had to be one group. <laughs> so it wasn't a lot of activity, but it, it was there. And we quickly put up a, um, a widget on our website where people could set an appointment for a tasting. So that we, we, you know, we limited that way. We had a limited number of appointments and they were a certain period of time and so forth. And that actually had some really positive aspects to it in that um, you had to pay for your tasting when you signed up for it and people showed up. Um, so it was very productive in terms of staffing because we knew we weren't just going to have somebody sitting there hoping that somebody would show up. Um, you know, we, had, we staffed it when we knew we had appointments and 
Please pay. It's great. Myrna is wondering, how do you mar market your corporate events? Um, uh, not really. <laughs> I mean, they're on our website and, um, um, you know, we, we ask for referrals from the people that we deliver them to. So this whole word of mouth is, you know, great, um, but we don't pay them to refer us. Um, it's just sort of happening. Um, and uh, the only other thing I will say is respond to media inquiries because the topic of virtual tastings was very interesting to the media um, as the pandemic progressed. And so, again, Google, they would find us and they'd say, can you answer a few questions about us? So you're doing virtual tastings. Can you answer some questions? And that, um, so there were a couple of articles that were published that mentioned us as well. Um, let's see, I think we only have time for one or two more, but Robert is wondering, are your virtual events also identifying new product ideas, apple syrup, baking apples, and recipes? Ah, uh, they haven't, they haven't as much. Um, that's an interesting, we don't do non-alcoholic things because it's a very different regulatory scheme. Um, so we only do alcoholic ciders. Um, and we do a pretty large range already. <laughs> so the tastings pretty much focus on what we've got. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, that hasn't been as much a part of it. And this is actually, this final question is a good segue, um, because it's something that Caroline is also going to address and that I think everyone is wondering, how did you manage to create a wow experience? Um, well, if I look at the comments on why people gave us such high ratings, it really has to do with, um, you know, the fact that, you know, the founder is on the phone talking with passion about their product, which I think is what everybody wants to hear. You get to sense sort of who we are and what we're all about. Um, and we have a great story to tell about um, the orchards, the kinds of apples that we work with, and the purity of the cider that we make. And so, and, and hopefully they also, our ratings for the actual ciders were pretty darn good too, so that helps. Uh, Lisa, you're, yeah, there you go. Yes, okay, just unmuted right. myself. You know, you, we have to have a, we haven't had any major technical glitches yet, so we have to have some. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much, Eleanor. Um, Eleanor is sticking around and, you know, we'll see how much. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep looking at questions in the chat too. Yeah, that's great. I wasn't, I was only too much going on in the chat, so I couldn't keep track of that. I was only looking at the Q&A. So if you're able, Eleanor, feel free to, you know, give answers in the chat um, while we turn it over to Caroline Miller, who um, I'll introduce her now. And she is first and foremost a farmer. She owns and runs a five-star agritourism business called The Hideaway Experience. And she's also a rural business consultant based in the county of Angus in Scotland, which is just over one hour north of Edinburgh. Caroline was brought up on the family farm in Perthshire, where she helped in all aspects of the farm, as well as the agritourism bed and breakfast business. Caroline is the sector league, lead for agritourism in Scotland, and she is the facilitator of the Scottish Enterprise Agritourism Monitor Farm, which is, this sounds really cool. It's like right up our alley in extension. Um, it's a knowledge exchange and skills development program to support agritourism growth in Scotland. Caroline has spent the last eight years researching international tourism, and she undertook a Nuffield scholarship focused on agritourism in 2012. She spoke at the first World Congress on agritourism in Italy back in 2018, which is where I was fortunate to meet her. So thank you so much, Caroline, for joining us from Scotland. We can see your slide, Caroline. I don't hear you yet. Make sure you unmute yourself. Sorry, I am now. <laughs> Perfect, yes. I don't like the fact that you said we've had no technical issues just before I talk. <laughs> <laughs> we talk. We don't want to actually look like professionals here. <laughs> yeah. We're doing this virtual experience thing at the same time everybody else is. 
So good evening everyone. It is evening here. It's 5.30 in the evening. It's um, pitch black outside here in Scotland. So, um, But it's lovely to, to be here and to be speaking to so many people from, from all over the world on a subject that I'm very passionate about. So um, I hope you can see my screen. This is where I live. I'm very fortunate to call this home. And we are located one hour and 20 minutes north of the city of Edinburgh in Scotland. We're in the county of Angus, and this is our farm. Um, it is a mixed farm. We, um, the fields you can see are fields that have been growing barley for making malting whiskey um, and growing oats and wheat. And then we also have another farm just further up the hill there, um, which is where our cows and our sheep live. And they and we produce um, Scotch beef and Scotch lamb on the farm. Um, you'll see in the photograph here, there's some um, tourism accommodation. This is, um, these are our luxury hideaways. Um, we have four hideaways for couples. Um, they're all accredited five star from Visit Scotland, who are our national marketing and quality assurance body for tourism in Scotland. And we've run this tourism business since 2005. Um, we also offer farm tours on our farm. So this is the view looking north. This is the Sidlaw Hills. And these, these hills stretch from um, where we live along to the city of Perth. And we um, take our guests around the farm to show them what we do. Um, we tell them the story of our family, who um, my husband's family have farmed in these hills for generations. We talk about the environment and wildlife and um, we obviously talk about the Scotch beef and Scotch lamb and the, the malt and barley that goes into whiskey. This is the view from the top of our hill. Um, so it's a pretty beautiful place to, to live. And the water in the background is the River Tay, which runs from um, way up in the Highlands, Highlands of Perthshire down to the city of Dundee and out to the North Sea. Uh, one of our cows here. Um, and that's just another shot of our, our accommodation. So this is some of the Scotch beef that we produce on the farm, and we also um, sell this to our guests that come to stay with us. And one of the things that I think is really important about agri-tourism is that there is a strong agri-experience as part of a visitor's um, visit to your farm or an overnight stay. And obviously, as farmers, we're food producers predominantly. That's our, our main thing that we do. So um, being able to have that food experience, particularly food that's straight from the farm, is a really rich consumer experience that we know that guests enjoy. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I facilitate um, an agri-tourism monitor farm, which is a knowledge exchange program for businesses in Scotland for farmers who are thinking about starting an agri-tourism business, right through to people who've been in the trade for 50 years. Um, we have some of the people in this picture who are celebrating 50 years in agri-tourism uh, next year. So it's a great way to come together. Um, we've been coming together virtually since March and we miss seeing each other. Um, but we can't wait to, to come together every month again and share knowledge and, and learn new skills. Ivy Tourism, as you know, it, it sits in the middle of a, it's a sweet spot really, in the middle of agriculture, food and drink, and rural tourism and leisure. And it can contribute so much to these three areas of the rural economy. Um, and I, you know, I'm interested, I've always been interested in agri-tourism because it has so many benefits to so many people within the rural economy. I know there's not an international definition for agri-tourism and we have looked at this quite a bit in Scotland, but we needed to make a definition in Scotland so that our sector would have more of an identity and also because we're soon to start in February measuring the impact of our sector. I mentioned Visit Scotland earlier. Visit Scotland 
also have a, a, an, an economist and an in-house market research arm and they will start tracking the growth of agritourism in Scotland and we'll be able to have that data soon. So we think it's really important that agritourism is about real farmers. There are some fake farmers out there who um, are trying to um, pretend they're real farmers so that they can um, take that tourism pound. Um, but we think it's important they're real farmers from real farms. And we use the Go Rural logo in Scotland to show um, that it's real, they're real farmers. These are the types of agritourism that happens in Scotland. We're not just predominantly accommodation. Um, and we're not just predominantly kind of events. We are a whole range of um, activities, both day visits, eating experiences, and overnight stays. And as I mentioned before, Go Rural is consumer facing, and then Scottish agritourism is a sector body, which is a business to business membership organization. I'm just flagging this up because I think we are trying in Scotland to change the mindset about how a farmer would think about his livestock, his or her livestock. So here we have um, a lamb. Um, if you're lucky, you'd sell a lamb um, to market at £100. But what we're saying is, you know, it's, it's an uncertain time for us with COVID and the recession, which unfortunately might, might be coming as a result of the economic outbreak. Um, impact of COVID and also um, in Scotland and the UK where we're looking at Brexit of coming out of the EU soon and what that might mean. So we're really working with farmers to get them to think about adding value to their lamb by um, having farm tours, um, having different experiences, people paying you to watch your sheep get rounded up by a sheepdog, um, and we think that can add a lot of value to um, an asset that you have. So I'll now talk about the farm tours. Um, and this is where all our farm tours can be found on the Go Rural Facebook page. And you can see all the videos there and you can watch them um, at your leisure. So back in March, when we went into um, lockdown for COVID, everybody was feeling very um, worried about what was happening as, as consumers, as visitors, but also um, for our, for our agri-tourism community and the wider tourism community. And we were all feeling a bit flat. Um, a lot of us were cancelling the actual tours that we had already sold on our farm. So some people had sold £20,000 worth of lambing experiences or £5,000 worth of lambing experiences and having to refund the money to, to people um, that couldn't come and visit anymore, cancelled holidays, etc. So these friends of mine and I got together and we thought we would put on two weeks of live tours, um, which we called the Lamathon. And we ran a live tour from the lambing shed or the field um, every day for a fortnight. And that's how it started. I'll just show you some examples of some of the, the videos. I'm sorry, I hope you can hear the sound, but if you can, I'll it's quite straightforward what's happening here. I've got some alive birth. So obviously when you're showing a, a live birth on, on, a, on a video, you're hoping it's going to be a good outcome. Um, although it's important to show that in farming, um, you know, it's not, you know, animals do, do die sometimes. Animals do not make it, um, you know, through birth, etc. But, um, you know, this is the kind of film that has been shown. Um, people can see nature. Um, can see these lambs being born. One of the things that we've had great feedback on is how people were impressed by how much we cared about our animals and the high welfare standards we have in Scotland. 
Um, and that's a really important thing for us to be able to communicate as a, as a sector. So that's the, the lambing. Just something simple as well, like if you're sitting at home in your city centre flat, you've got no garden, you're locked down with COVID, and you can turn on your video at one o'clock and watch something as lovely as a, a real arm getting bottle fed, and you can see what a difference that was making to people who are watching. We asked the people that were taking part, the farmers, so I must say that once we've, once we've done two weeks of lambing, the figures were so great, and I'll share those in a minute, that we then started on um, general um, farm topics, from vegetables to dairy to beef um, to environment to all sorts of topics. And we asked the farmers that were taking part um, if they would make a little trailer, a little promotional video, which we ran um, the day before their video. Um, so this is just one example here. Um, So we, we found that um, making a trailer was really important because um, it built up hype, it, it brought more people on the next day to watch the video, um, and it gave people a real introduction. Um, I'll just give you another. The sound is not working well. Are we going to fix that? Okay, I'm sorry. Is the sound not working? Apologies. Yeah, um, that's okay. Okay, and this one, I've just got one, two more videos, but one has sound on it. So I'm just going to play this one and then move on. Um, this is just an example of, um, we also were helping people with their mental health by providing videos of beautiful scenery, and um, this is one of our farmers who lives by Loch Lomond. Um, so you'll see that, you know, people again, who weren't able to enjoy this beautiful scenery, um, this was something that people loved to, 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 to join in. And this is actually right on the edge of one of our farms. Um, if we don't have sound, I can't play Chris's bagpipes, but I will make it available afterwards. Um, so just in terms of the numbers, we had in a three-month period, 10,000 families or individuals watched one of the tours live. Um, two and a half million saw one of the posts. Um, and we, we had in three months, three quarters of a million minutes of live views live videos viewed by individuals. We, the Lamathon, which was the first two weeks, um, these are some of the stats. I won't, I won't go through them all, but the point I was trying to make was that we measured the impact of what we were doing very thoroughly so that we could share this information with um, various people in industry and the government um, that could demonstrate the impact that these live tours were having not only on our sector, but to promote Scottish tourism as a whole. And then Welcome to My Farm was what followed on from Lamathon. One of the key things as well is that often the perception of a farmer is, it, is somebody who's in their 60s or 70s and who's a man. Um, we have many men and women 
young, young middle-aged and not so middle-aged um, take part in this. So it really did show equality and how great it was, you know, to see women and men working together as equals in farming. Some of the challenges, we have some farms who couldn't take part because they don't have 4G and no connectivity on their phone. And all the people who took part had never, ever done a live tour before. It was a massive steep learning curve. We really had to push them to take part. It was a really scary thing. I did a two or three tours myself and knowing that it was coming up to one o'clock and you had to start and you'd no option um, and no way of getting out of it was quite stressful for some people. So everybody really gave it their best shot. Sometimes we had problems with people with their phone on their side or you couldn't hear the sound, as I'm demonstrating today with my videos, so apologies about that. Um, a couple of times health and safety breaches with people on bikes with no helmets, but everybody just gave it their best shot. And I think it's important with these videos that it's not a um, completely, you know, it's not the BBC, it's not a completely professional um, over edited um, thing, it's come, it's quite raw and it's authentic. I think that's also important. So again, these, these stats will be available at the end, but we were able to feed back to individuals who took part about how um, many minutes their video had been viewed and the reach that they had. These are the stats on the live viewers that we fed back to different businesses. And you know, it was great to be able to demonstrate to them the, the return that they had. Nobody paid for any of this. This was all done um, on a voluntary basis for our sector. And so it was able, we were able to show them what taking part had delivered and what the reach was. Um, so you know, as you see here, figures in excess of 20,000. What was really interesting was where people were watching from. And I know many of you tonight are, are, are joining us from the USA and from Canada. And you'll see that we had a big um, number of people from these areas who loved watching a Scottish farm. And many people have been in touch since then saying as soon as we get COVID out of the way, they want to come to Scotland on holiday. So we can't wait to welcome all these people. Um, and hopefully you as well that are listening to this just now to come to Scotland and ex experience a Scottish farm for yourself. Finally, we, we surveyed, we had 550 responses from our Facebook followers and we asked them what they enjoyed most about the live tours. People enjoyed these elements here that are on the left. Um, but you know, just being able to see a different farm every, every day and meeting Scottish farmers Beautiful landscapes. Landscapes is the main reason that tourists come to Scotland over any other factor. And you know, we were seventy percent of Scotland is farmland, and we were reinforcing you know how beautiful our landscapes are. How likely are they to visit a Scottish farm in the next twelve months? This is great. You know, this was converting people into wanting to come and visit one of our farms. And also when they're on a farm, what do they want to do? Visit a farm cafe for lunch and dinner, buy food from a farm shop and buy from a farmer's market. So that real conversion into watching a video and wanting to buy produce from a farm, that's really important for our agricultural, food and drink and tourism sectors. These are some of the comments that people said about you know, why they love the tours. Um, loving how honest all the farmers have been, just the diversity. Um, my particular favourite comment is how young and glamorous the farmers are. I thought that was nice. But also, a lot of our international viewers love the ancestry, um, and several got in touch to say that their ancestors were from near some of the farms that we were, we were showcasing. What's next? A big campaign for next year, six weeks of live Lamathon starting in March. Um, building skills and confidence, trying to do that just now during the winter so we're ready to go, um, and converting live visitors into actual visitors. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed that and sorry about the sound problems. Thanks so much, Caroline.
we'll, uh, we, I'm happy to say we have a little time left, so we'll jump to some questions here. Um, one of the general questions is, how do you monetize virtual programs? And we heard a little bit from Eleanor about how that works for her. In your case, it's a little different. Um, and you, we did have, looking through the registration list, you know, specific questions on, should I charge for virtual farm tours? How much should I charge? So tell us a little bit, Caroline, about your decisions there. Um, if you're charging for anything, if it's all free, and how that's working out. So at the moment, we haven't charged for any tours. We have that we've done through Go Rural, but it is something that we're looking into. We're looking into things like having a, a lambing club for children where they can pay, a parent can pay, you know, for a session of six weeks where they join um, and there's maybe six or ten of them can be part of this farm virtually for, you know, and answer questions with the farmer and things. Um, but what some of our members have done that took part in the live tours, they have been doing some paid farm experiences themselves as a result of starting off with us. So people doing drinks demonstrations like Eleanor or people have been doing at Christmas have been doing wreath making um, and have sold wreath boxes out in, in the post and then people joining in in groups of six to make a wreath for your door. Um, in terms of monetized, wondering how much the economic impact is, we've had, obviously we've, we were shut, the tourism was shut down until July here and then opened up a little bit, no international visitors, but some quite a lot of domestic people come into the countryside from July till about October. We had a lot of farms who, who people would get in touch with me saying, these people found us on the farm tour. So for the farmers that are asking the question, where do you find out about us? They, they are recording that it's come through a live tour that they've done on Go Rural. Um, so that's all we can really do at the moment to monitor what it meant in money terms. Yes, Here, here's another question um, for Caroline, which is uh, kind of the, again, getting into the logistics of it. Who organized the videos um, and selected the videos? If the association had to manage the involvement of farmers and convince them, or were they willing to participate? Um, and, you know, everybody's very impressed with the numbers you obtained, so they're kind of curious how you ended up there. So, initially, the sort of 14 of us that got together at the start were doing it on a total wing and a prayer. We hadn't a clue what we were doing. Um, it was just lockdown. We didn't have microphones. We didn't know what way to hold our phone up. We'd never done this before. We are watching YouTube videos, etc. And so, um, but we got going and then other people thought they would give this a go. But I would say that, so I, myself and a lady from Visit Scotland were the ones who were contacting people. I would contact someone and um, talk them through it. They had guidance notes which we issued out. We then phoned them to make sure they understood the guidance notes. We went through about half an hour of training with each person is a lot of work. Um, we, we set up the video, we phoned them the day before to make sure they weren't going to bottle it and not, not come on. Um, we did social posts to promote their tour. We took their trailer video and loaded it up the day before. And um, yeah, that, that was it. We phoned them afterwards to say well done. Um, but we didn't have trouble getting people once they got started. But um, it, it, it is quite a lot of work. Great, yes. It's very impressive. And we do have a lot more questions on kind of getting into the logistics. One, one is, was everything on a phone? Were people in stationary locations or people are walking around their farms doing it? Yeah, so everybody did it on their phone. Um, once we'd got going a few weeks, people started to buy microphones um, had a little, a little microphone which improved the sound a lot better. One of the problems we have is 
believe it or not, it's sometimes quite windy in Scotland. So one of the problems is, you know, some people got a flat, calm day with a blue sky and everything looked wonderful. Other people's live dates was like blowing an abs, what we call a hooey, blowing an absolute gale, wind, rain, you know, and so the sound could be a challenge. So people then got microphones, learned to do some of the tour, like in a shed. You know, we got, we all got better at it as we were going along. Um, and we, um, you know, people bought gimbals, so they were, the, the motion was steadier, but it was all done on phones. It is very impressive. So we've got a number of questions here that we are not going to get through, but I want to close with one final question for both Caroline and Eleanor, which you touched on a little bit, but I've seen it a lot in the questions, so I want to go a little deeper into the, the what's next. Is this just a pandemic thing, or do you see a future in these virtual experiences, even, um, even post-COVID um, travel restrictions? Um, Caroline, do you want to go first? Yeah, so I mean, I think there's no doubt when everybody was sitting at home, going nowhere, um, you did have quite a captive audience. Um, so yeah, that you know that was, you know, if if all your if the highlight of your day was one o'clock watching a sheep give birth, then you know there was quite a lot of people who, um, yeah, who, who that you know that was a captive audience for us. So. As people started to move about a bit more and managed to get out, our audiences did go down live. But what we found was people were then watching the videos in their own time in the evening. So our minutes of videos viewed didn't decrease. So that was quite interesting. People might not be joining live, but they watched you within 24 hours. So, um, and yes, I think that you know, I think there's definitely a space for this. I think um, what we're grappling with just now is it, it is resource hungry because you've got to, there's a lot to do to set it up. Um, so, you know, do we charge farmers for it as an extra thing? Um, you know, how, how do we do it? But we need to maintain momentum if you're going to run it as well. So I think like doing things like six weeks of daily lamathon, folk love Folk love births, like live births. We had a goat video given a birth, a goat given a birth that went, you know, hundreds of thousands of views. So people seem to like that. Um, so I think for particular things that will continue. Thanks so much, Caroline. Eleanor, what are your plans? Um, now we're still in the stuck in the middle of the pandemic, but hopefully yeah. people will come out we, and people will be traveling. Same, what are your thoughts yeah. there? We saw the same thing as Caroline with when things opened up in the summer, um, there are interest in virtual tastings decreased, like there are fewer people that signed up to participate. Um, and then as the fall came and so forth, it's really gone up again. So uh, post pandemic, I don't know. I mean, I, part of me is just really looking forward to welcoming people back in person. Um, and if, if we can do as much as possible to to create that excitement, you know, the, the way that Caroline has shown, you know, people want to come visit Scotland because they watch these videos, um, then, then I'm looking forward to that. All right. Well, thank you both so much. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today. Um, we didn't get to all the questions. We can, we'll stop the recording in just a moment, um, you know, after we officially close and I'll try to spend a little time um, answering questions here for those of you who do want to stay on a little bit longer, but totally respect your time. And I know a lot of you are running off to something else in, um, you know, at the top of the hour. So we will, for everyone, we'll follow up with an email afterwards and it will have our contact information as well as resources and the slides that you saw today. We do want to keep this conversation going not just about virtual experiences. And I'm gonna share my screen one last time to show you what's coming up here. Let's see, we already did the polls. Um, so coming up on January 13th, we're gonna be talking about farm-based education in every city and town, not just in the US, we've got other examples as well. 
And then February 17th, we'll be focused on um, the role of agritourism in the racial justice movement. So we want to thank all of you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you again in January. Enjoy the holidays.